Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to lecture number 7, Images and um, Embodiment. Um, in this lecture, I will um, talk about the idea of embodiment um, in how it is understood in a very classical uh, context um, in academic uh, scholarship. Um, and then I will build on the idea of embodiment, um, particularly um, in the backdrop of the digital. And um, this is to place the conversation on images and embodiment um, in the current context um, that we are in, in the digital age. Um, and then we will see how the idea of embodiment, how the idea of um, uh, embodiment in the digital um, you know, contributes to the idea of images and vice versa, you know, how images um, contribute to the idea of, um, you know, embodiment in the age of the digital. So, I will be exploring uh, some theoretical frameworks um, in this respect, um, some uh, in the classical context of embodiment and some in the digital um, context of embodiment. So, if you are familiar with the history of um, embodiment, you would know that um, the idea of uh, embodiment uh, is, is coming from classic philosophical uh, tenets um, that the idea that humans are living, thinking, feeling beings that inhabit and interact with the physical world. So, you see that um, you know this is this holistic approach to understanding embodiment that um, it is transgressing, it is trans, um, you know, including, um, you know, trans boundary sort of functions, um, the, the fact that humans are living, thinking, feeling beings, and, you know, they interact, they inhabit uh, a physical world. Now, this idea um, of embodiment has later been used across disciplines um, such as sociology, such as anthropology, such as computer science. And uh, we do see that the way that uh, the idea of uh, embodiment has been used in each of these disciplinary um, terrains has been, um, of course, slightly different from the other. So, we do see that embodiment has uh, been used as, uh, as a role of communication and language um, and also as a science of experience. Um, particularly in sociology and anthropological literatures on embodiment. Um, and um, in, from the computer science angle and, and bringing this to the conversation of the digital age and bringing it to an understanding of um, situating a social science, um, you know, concept here um, is understanding the body in digital spaces. And the image of the body, the idea of embodiment um, in the digital age is um, something uh, that is of central focus um, in this lecture. And I welcome you to, um, you know, look deeper into uh, the areas, into the scholarship of um, embodiment, classical embodiment. So, you can actually build on um, the idea of embodiment in the digital age. So, um, when we think of embodiment, you know, now that we have this uh, characteristics uh, in mind when we talk of embodiment, um, you know, particularly from the social science perspective, um, that it's a role of communication and language, um, and it's also a science of experience. Um, and finally, you know, we're trying to understand embodiment as you know, the body in digital space. Um, I also encourage you to recall uh, some of the, um, you know, uh, scholarship, some of the critical thinkers we have um, already talked about um, 
in this lecture series who deal with ideas of communication and language who deal with the science of uh, you know sort of experience um, of the image uh, you know the viewer or the spectator um, and the image per se to actually bring this to your understanding of embodiment um, in digital spaces so um, if we are to actually theorize uh, you know embodiment um, in the digital context um, we see that um, you know if we adopt a socio material sort of an approach uh, to understanding digital um, embodiment um, which is the ways in which non human actors interact with humans as a central topic for understanding social life subjectivity and their environment so when I say non-human actors, um, you know, uh, we can use images um, in this case as non-human actors, but of course, um, you know, uh, images would also have some sort of, uh, you know, a power dynamic attached to them um, that will speak to questions of, um, you know, subjectivity and em embodiment. And we have seen, um, you know, in, in the previous lectures, how um, this idea of, uh, you know, the uncritical uh, viewer uh, gets translated to the idea of the subject. So, we have seen that journey, uh, you know, in the previous lectures. So, I, I welcome you to bring in that lens now to understanding um, embodiment particularly in um, the digital context. So, um, what we see is that um, you know digital technologies um, you know the, when the medium becomes digital they um, they are increasingly now playing you know a major role in our life and uh, you know they are in the process whether we understand it or not. Um, you know, they're configuring sort of uh, concepts uh, of selfhood, of um, embodiment, of social relationships, um, of human, non-human relations, um, of space, of time, of place, um, and so on. So, the very fact, I mean, um, that, that we are living, um, you know, in a we have lived in a pre-pandemic um, sort of society and have transitioned to a through a pandemic um, situation into a, if I may, a post-pandemic sort of a society. Um, you know, we have uh, seen this transition and much of it, much of this transition, um, we see the digital has a very important role to play. So, suddenly, uh, for example, around the world, um, you know, we see, um, you know, education, for example, has gone online, education has gone digital. We see, um, you know, um, uh, formal um, meetings, we see any sort of formal interactions, um, you know, the digital is now a respectable form of that interaction. So, we do see that, uh, you know, the digital has been, um, you know, uh, sort of, you know, entering into our lives, um, uh, you know, infiltrating into our lives and then, um, you know, the idea of embodiment has been um, evolving with the idea of uh, the digital. And so, some scholars, um, you know, scholars who deal with uh, the area of digital embodiment, they strongly believe that uh, the idea of culture, the idea of society, you know, um, the guiding parameters that we attach to, to understanding images, um, you know, they, so these parameters can um, not now be um, you know, they cannot be fully understood without uh, recognizing, you know, the digital, without, without recognizing computer software, computer hardware, um, and then uh, with that rec or, or even devices, for example. And, um, you know, with that, we do see that uh, we are again reconstituting the ideas of, um, you know, selfhood, embodiment, social life, social institutions, for example. So, um, you know, this is an assertion that, um, you know, digital technologies, you know, just like material cultural artifacts, um, as we have seen, for example, um, you know, in the postcard, uh, lecture on postcards, 
or um, you know photographs as performative spaces. We have seen this material cultural artifacts and so digital uh, technologies they are slowly becoming or you know not, not that slowly becoming um, you know a constitutive part of what makes us human. And so um, the idea of uh, you know embodiment now is uh, sort of evolving um, given the digital background. <clears throat> so um, we do see that uh, you know you know there are scholars who have been working in um, you know this terrain for a pretty long time but um, you know there is a sudden burst of scholarship in this respect also and you know thus giving rise to um, you know new areas of inquiry such as um, we see you know we hear terms of the digital humanities turn um, in scholarship also. So um, you know on that note um, you know the contentions engaging with digital um, you know that makes us less human or authentic is that not only are we just as human in the digital world, the digital also provides many new opportunities um, for us to understand what makes us human. So it is really a, a you know, symbiotic two way process that uh, you know, we are actually interacting, we are investigating um, with uh, you know, digital technologies and that is in a way informing the human experience. And that human experience is in a way contributing to the idea of how we define um, you know the social world. So if we have to um, you know narrow down the focus and look at only images um, for, um, for this discussion um, in the digital age and around the questions of uh, embodiment we do see that uh, you know images uh, become uh, very important sources of data um, in the digital uh, platform. And um, you know this, this nature of data is often very qualitative, you know whether it is a still image or whether it is a moving image, um, but they become very important sources of data um, and they you know are, are culturally you know symbolic objects. Um, on, on the digital platform. So um, as uh, digital data objects, um, images um, then structure our concepts of identity, of embodiment, of relationships and our choices and preferences and um, even our access to spaces. So um, you know we are dealing with uh, you know new forms of data here. So we are still talking about images but the form of um, you know images would change as we transition into, uh, into a very different platform. And in this case when image becomes digital data, when image becomes a you know digital cultural object um, you know the ideas that they would influence us um, you know differently is more acceptable. And so um, you know this uh, creation of a new human non-human sort of an um, you know interaction you know embodiment they again not surprisingly is a product of complex decisions, complex networks, um, creative ideas of course and uh, you know it, it brings together um, you know questions of uh, methods and methodologies that we adopt in doing research um, with images on digital platforms for um, you know just for examples creating, managing, storing, using data ethically uh, and so on and so forth. So um, you know images form you know a very important part of uh, you know how we understand embodiment particularly um, in the digital um, age and digital platform. So um, just to look at how images uh, you know become material cultures um, and you know how all of that would translate to the digital platform, um, we do see that um, 
you know, the questions of appropriation, the questions of domestication, uh, you know, in everyday practices and routines, um, you know, these are questions of the new digital media. And, uh, you know, the theories of material culture and consumption, you know, are now reconfigured or reconstructed with this in view to understanding the ways in which the new digital media is, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, recreating or, or redefining questions of uh, what is appropriated or domesticated. And, um, you know, many anthropologists, for example, sociologists, for example, who deal with the digital, um, you know, centrally in their research, um, they have actually, um, you know, focused attention on the, on the ways in which people engage with the digital because, you know, how an individual would engage with the digital, um, you know, whether it's an image or something else would define the process of embodiment for, um, for that person. And um, so here, um, the conception of uh, the conceptualization of um, what is uh, known as appropriation refers to the incorporation of objects into habitual practices, while that of domestication relates to the ways in which objects are altered in some way via the routine practices. So, what the digital, uh, you know, scholars, scholars who are dealing with the digital moment um, in social sciences um, are looking at is, uh, you know, how the concepts of appropriation, how the concepts of domestication are um, sort of altered in the, in, in ways of habitual um, practices. And here, um, let us pause for a minute and look at, um, you know, an important theoretical lens again um, that we find helpful to understand how concepts of, you know, um, you know, appropriation, how, um, you know, concepts of domestication, um, you know, are linked with habitual practices. So, we have looked at, uh, in one of the previous lectures in this series, um, we have looked at Pierre Bourdieu's, uh, you know, work of, uh, on the habitus, right. The habitus, um, you know, creating, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a social space that is informed by cultural norms and practices. Now, um, you know, coming from Bourdieu and bringing in the lens of, um, you know, uh, uh, habitus, um, you know, Bourdieu also, um, you know, puts forward some more theoretical elements um, in the form of, um, symbolic dominance and violence, which, uh, which is an exercise of dominance through culture. He puts forward the idea of capital, that is the resources we have to live with and, uh, you know, the forms of capital, uh, you know, are, can be exchanged with each other and coming to that explanation in a minute. And, and he's also talking about fields. And the fields, relatively autonomous spaces in which social relationships get organized. And such relationships can be economic, social, cultural, and symbolic. And so, along with habitus, which we have already looked at, um, you know, capital and social fields, um, you know, become very important um, components, theoretical lenses to understand um, when we place an image in the context of embodiment, um, you know, what are we exactly looking at? What are, you know, what are the components we are looking at? So, um, uh, one way to look at it, and, and this is building on the idea of capital, um, you know, as proposed by Bourdieu, um, is, um, you know, reproducing inequalities um, and dominance. So, uh, you know, Bourdieu talks about four forms of capital, um, economic, um, cultural, social, and symbolic. And uh, in that respect, if we take this um, conversation to the digital platform, and if we take it in the context of images and embodiment, we will see that each of these capital, each of these forms of capital um, would be informing the idea of embodiment uh, when it comes to the context of, uh, of an image. 
So, in other words, Bourdieu actually builds um, on the idea of field also as objective elements of the social environment and um, is which is defined as a network or a configuration of objective relations between positions. These positions are objectively defined in their existence and in the determinations they impose upon their occupants as well as by the objective relation to the positions of domination, subordination, homology, etc. And so, you know, what Bourdieu is doing here is giving us a sense of the, you know, diversity, giving us a sense of the rhizomatic uh, nature of space. And he's talking about, um, you know, various forms of, uh, you know, fields or spaces, um, being material space, being social space, being discursive space. And, you know, the habitus is actually sitting at the intersection of these various spaces. So the habitus, um, you know, then the social field becomes an important, uh, you know, element where images are constructed, where images are negotiated, and, um, you know, how images, you know, um, influence our ideas of, uh, you know, embodiment. Um, just to exemplify um, what Bourdieu was talking about with regard to capital and uh, you know the the ideas of reproducing inequalities and dominance, is that um, you know for example if if we look at capital um, you know in in forms of economic and cultural and education becomes an example of uh, the cultural um, the ways in which people would use cultural knowledge to establish their place in the hierarchy and um, you know as I said in starting of this uh, lecture um, you know um, you know the fact that education has gone digital the fact that education has gone online um, you know in a post covid moment um, is um, you know an evolution of sort of the cultural capital um, uh, as as using Bourdieu's lens. So how does all of this and you know this of course Bourdieu would situate within a larger theory of practice or uh, praxis theory, and um, you know how would all of this then um, you know come together when we talk of um, embodiment in the context of images, and so. Um, Bourdieu uh, has actually worked um, in this respect in the context of um, photography. And, uh, you know, this becomes interesting here because according to uh, Bourdieu, photography oftentimes manifests decisions about judgment and value. So, um, when we talk of a photograph, for example, um, in one of the lectures I've talked about this is that we're talking about the frame of the photograph, right? And that frame, um, to define that frame is also to go through a conscious decision making process. And once you capture that frame uh, for the photographer, um, you know, the, the process of relationship between the frame and the photographer sort of evolves. And um, so, you know, it is a decision that, you know, you know, that that is manifesting a form of judgment or value. Um, and uh, it also reveals uh, the social and cultural forces that guides the process of the photographer's lens that, you know, if the photographer is using the lens with an agenda, with an intention, or, um, you know, is it is it an immature sort of a, a you know, using of the lens. So, um, in this respect, actually Bourdieu writes, and I quote him here, um, adequately understanding a photograph means not only recovering the meanings which it proclaims, that is to a certain extent the explicit intention of the photographer, it also means deciphering the surplus of meaning which it betrays by being part of the symbolism of the age, a class or an artistic group. So what Bourdieu is referring to behind using the photograph here uh, is also a very subtle way of class construction, a very subtle way of group construction. And in a way, it's also relating to questions of, um, you know, 
capital, power dynamics and boundary work. And so Bodhi was taking us through the vehicle of photography, vehicle of photography as an example of image, um, to also show us how images, you know, forms a technology um, which informs, um, you know, the type of, um, you know, embodiment, how we uh, relate to it. The, in, in that case then, um, you know, um, the, the journey that uh, photography as image uh, would accomplish here is also, uh, you know, talking to the social and historical constructions of, uh, you know, social groups of social classes. And, um, and in this case, uh, you know, the biography of the photographer um, is sort of revealed in the choices that they make. Um, and at the same time, the image maker remains visibly absent. And so I would like you to recall um, what we talked about in the very first uh, lecture of the series, um, the idea of sociological imagination uh, as proposed by C.W. Mills. And um, in sociological imagination, uh, if you can recall, um, the biography, uh, you know, component becomes an important um, part. So history biography, um, um, you know, of the society is an important factor um, behind the dynamics of society. So, uh, and here Bodhi also brings in that concept of biography of the photographer and, you know, how the photographer actually um, is um, making a choice of using, um, you know, the lens and that in turn, how, um, you know, is, is it influencing questions of um, embodiment. So, from here, uh, then let us now look at, um, you know, what or how has the idea of um, the self, the idea of selfhood, um, the idea of embodiment um, evolved in the era of the cyber. And, uh, you know, this is uh, situating the self you know, embodiment, um, you know, in, a, in an era that we live in now. Um, so, we do see that the period spanning um, the two decades from early 1980s um, to the, um, you know, first few years of the 21st century was the era of the cyber in social, cultural and political theory in research. So, we do see this turn, this paradigm shift um, in social scientific research. Um, where um, it is, um, you know, referred to as the era of the um, uh, cyber. And we do see that in this era of the cyber, um, you know, very prominent and popular concepts relating to the self, relating to, um, you know, images that speaks to question of the self, to uh, questions of selfhood, um, to embodiment, uh, you know, uh, came up in scholarship. And, um, you know, one of the very prominent concepts is the concept of the cyborg and which I will talk about um, in, in a minute. Um, but we also see, um, you know, concepts of cyberspace, cyber feminism, cyber culture, cyber crime, etc. So, um, you know, the cyber um, now becomes, you know, sort of a dynamic behind the embodiment process. And, um, of course, um, the cyber would um, approach understanding an image or the form of the image very, very differently than a conventional form of that image. So, um, cyberspace, um, you know, if we have to bring in the concept of uh, space here, um, you know, has been portrayed as a virtual non-physical network in which users interacted with each other by employing computer technologies. So, uh, you know, human meets human on a cyber platform and, um, you know, the nature of interaction in that platform, of course, um, you know, is going to bring in a very different um, ideological construct of the image, a very different um, ideological construct of the self. And, um, and so, um, you know, the idea of, um, you know, um, augmented reality, the idea of, um, you know, virtual reality um, is 
is very, very different. So when I say, um, you know, augmented reality or when I say virtual reality, I'm talking um, in the, f in, in, you know, about forms of images um, that are very different form um, from the conventional static, um, you know, um, understanding of images that we have seen conventionally. So, um, uh, you know, augmented reality, virtual realities, um, mixed realities are, um, you know, signified as experiences that are very, um, very different from the conventional material um, realities that we understand. So, um, so then if we talk about, um, you know, uh, embodiment um, and images in digital platforms, um, then how do we understand, um, you know, sort of the digitized body? How do we understand the digitized self? And how does image then becomes, um, you know, a different form of ideological construct um, in, uh, you know, as a reflection of the digitized body? So there has been, um, you know, important research done by, um, digital anthropologists, digital sociologists, and, um, you know, other scholars who deal with digital media. And um, they have, you know, sort of argued that, uh, and, and recognized, they have also, um, you know, used it in their work, um, the ways in which human embodiment and concepts of selfhood are represented and configured via digital technologies and digital social networks. So when we talk of, um, you know, human relationships being reconfigured, for example, through digital social networks, um, you know, how does the questions of images and their role in influencing, you know, reflection of the self um, changes? So uh, it is not only the data or image produced via digital technologies that are important in this respect, um, but also how objects themselves, um, you know, are used in this practice. So it is not just a question of, you know, how the image um, is produced in the digital, but also a question of how, how the digital device, for example, you know, um, smartphones, uh, you know, computers, gaming technologies, wearable, uh, you know, technology devices, um, you know, how the devices themselves are also used in that practice. Um, and so, um, you know, so what we are getting on to um, is that a very, very complicated level of understanding of how images in the digital, um, you know, form or enter into a network um, you know, that is established by not just images of the viewer and the viewed, but also we have non-human actors such as digital devices now entering into that conversation. So, um, you know, I urge you to uh, bring in um, a couple of the critical lenses that we have seen, for example, Foucault's idea of, um, you know, power and the image. Um, you know, that we are not just dealing with image here, we are, we are dealing with non-human actors, um, you know, such as digital devices. And, you know, in the process, how the self is being reconfigured in that network. So, um, also for the digitized uh, body uh, at an ontological level, for example, um, we see that, you know, the sense of selfhood, uh, the self of embodiment, um, they're implicated with digital technologies. And, um, you know, we do see that our life um, sort of revolves around the dig digital. So, you know, um, you know, if you can imagine a moment um, in your life where you are completely device free, completely digital free, um, and then compare that moment of your life with, uh, you know, a moment where, you know, devices and the digital actually guide um, your lifestyle. So, um, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it can be from a very tiny, um, you know, wearable device that you wear, 
you know, when you go for a walk, or um, you know, it can be something like you know, a smartphone that you carry with you every day, or you know, gaming technologies, for example. And all of these, mind you, uh, you know, behind the scene in all of these uh, processes, images, uh, you know, are are acting either as cultural objects or or as data sources, um, you know, towards uh, contributing towards you know, um, reconfiguring your selfhood. So I um, also uh, want to recall um, for you here a critical lens um, that we have covered in lecture three. Um, and I want to bring in Derrida here um, and his lens of deconstruction um, just for application purposes. Um, you know, to see how various aspects of deconstruction are applied to the analysis of the image. And we do see that, uh, uh, you, know, you know, whether we view an image um, on the digital platform or um, whether, um, you know, a visual sign or a symbol or an image, you know, influences a digital device or, or, uh, or a similar object and that in, you know, in turn influences us, um, you know, that has, um, you know, a history of cultural context. So, you know, uh, Derrida and, and his lens of deconstruction forms, uh, you know, an important lens here um, um, in, 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 in the context of embodiment. So, um, uh, you know, Foucault, um, in this respect also would say that an image uh, would never simply be there, but it would be in a relationship uh, with context and spectator. And here, um, you know, since we are dealing with questions of embodiment, um, you know, the image and the context and the self, uh, you know, becomes, um, you know, of utmost importance. So um, again, Derrida would uh, you know talk about deconstruction's relationship to um, the visual, and you know part of this deconstructionist uh, technique is, uh, according to Derrida, is to expose the rule governing processes of a system of thought, and um, you know the system of thought is something that is um, that is of central importance here uh, is that um, you know what is significant is that much of this process takes place in the relationships outside of the image and including that of the spectator and the image and the culture and the image so if you are to draw a power geometry a network of relationships, um, you can also think of uh, you know uh, the actor network theory sort of a relationship, a complex uh, network, where we are looking at uh, you know the spectator, the image, the culture, um, you know as a holistic uh, sort of model, and then also looking beyond that. And I and I constantly you know urge you to think beyond that because if we cannot. Uh, contextualize, um, you know, much of these procedures in their cultural context, then, um, you know, we would be losing the nuances, the nuanced forms of meanings that we attach uh, to images. And um, for just as images, uh, you know, through this matrix of visual culture, they form these systems of representation. And, uh, you know, the systems of representation, um, you know, create spaces, um, also spaces of contestation. So we are bringing in, uh, you know, new forms of spaces here. In in this case, digital spaces, and we are forming new forms of systems of representation. So you know, how do we go about, um, you know, making meaning with regard to? Uh, you know the new 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 systems of representation in this case um, Derrida's uh, deconstructions um, and this deconstructions relationship to the visual uh, you know would be of much importance and um, you know once we can arrive at that uh, you know once we can establish we can also probably understand how a culture defines its visual limits um, you know um, 
as, which is as significant as the actual images it produces. So, um, of course, Derrida was not talking in the digital context, but if we take the digital uh, context here that um, you know how a culture um, actually um, you know decides its visual limits how a culture actually comes up with um, you know a norm and not not a norm sort of an understanding uh, you know that decision of visual limits is as important as um, you know the, the actual images that it produces so um, so Derrida becomes uh, you know an important lens here and so does Foucault uh, as uh, we had talked about. Um, so this is an example actually um, you know just to um, give you a sense of um, images in digital spaces um, before I go in details to talk about uh, you know Donna Haraway's work on the cyborg um, that um, you know, this is a study that was um, done by um, you know collaborative group of scholars, and the question that they are asking here is: um, Does a digital assistant need a body? And what they are looking at is image or the influence of visual embodiment and social behavior on the perception of intelligent virtual agents in AR. And uh, this is uh, this is a you know a series of uh, you know pictorial representations from their paper, which was presented at the 2018 IEEE International Symposium on Mixed and Augmented Reality. So what they are experimenting here is um, you know they are making uh, you know um, a virtual agent uh, using the AR technology and instructing. Um, an action. In this case, um, the action being turning on a lamp, and you know they have shown that um, in in the top series of uh, you know pictures, as you can see, that uh, you know the 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 first picture doesn't have an embodied um, character. It is only you know in vacuum that the instruction is going on. That please turn on the lamp, and the lamp is on. Um, and you know the corresponding picture in the um, bottom row. You will see that you know there's there's an acknowledgement that sure um, I will do, and then the lamp is on. But there's no um, you know um, uh, you know uh, virtual agent that is actually visible um, to to us who is actually performing that action. In the second set of images that you see that there is an image, there is a virtual agent. Who is standing there in the top uh, uh, photograph, as you can see, and when a command is made, please turn on the lamp. Um, you know that that virtual agent is um, using a tablet to turn on the lamp, and uh, you know just uh, you know not changing position, but you know just turning on the lamp. And the third uh, set of photographs that you see. Is that uh, that virtual agent is standing, and when a command is made, um, please turn on the lamp. Um, you know the 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 virtual agent is actually moving. The virtual agent is walking um, towards the lamp, and it turns it on. So um, once you see this experiment, one is once you see this. Of course, you know they are talking from a technological um, advance advancement sort of an aspect, but um, to a social scientist who's dealing with images and embodiment, the question is: Does it matter whether the virtual agent is present or not? Does it matter that we see a subject actually performing an action or not? In this case, does it matter for us who are dealing with questions of images and embodiment in digital spaces? Does it matter for us um, whether you know the first group of photographs are okay or the second group of photographs are okay or the third group of photographs is okay? Does it matter whether we see um, you know virtual agent um, you know visible? Visibly, um, you know, or does it matter if the virtual agent is there and you know the agent is moving or not, or using a different device to you know fulfill the function? So the questions that you are asking um, here um, have to be you know answered 
with their, within their socio-cultural contexts. And so, you know, does it matter whether there is a virtual agent or not? The answer to this, you know, you know, is heavily inspired, heavily um, sort of driven by um, the social positioning, the social conditioning of the viewer and the viewed. And, um, you know, this is what uh, I'm trying to, um, you know, get you to think about is that, um, you know, this power geometry that we have been talking about between the viewer, the viewed, you know, the role that images play in society, the functions that images play in society, how do those functions become meaningful? How do those functions, um, you know, become symbolic for our understanding of, in this case, embodiment? So um, from here, I'm going to go um, to the last part of um, my lecture here and bringing in a very, um, you know, uh, powerful lens uh, which has, you know, gained, you know, widespread acceptance um, and, um, you know, to talk about uh, images, to talk about human, non-human actors um, in digital spaces and um, questions of embodiment. So if you are familiar with um, um, Donna Haraway's work, um, you know, she is a technoscience feminist scholar um, and, you know, her most important writings have been on the cyborg. And, um, and you know, this is an important work that, um, you know, helps in conceptualizing the ontology and politics of human digital encounters. And um, she wrote her, um, you know, significant uh, groundbreaking essay, Manifesto of, uh, for Cyborgs in 85, 1985. And, uh, you know, that has remained, uh, you know, one of the most influential pieces of writing in cyber culture studies. Um, so what Haraway's idea of cyborg, uh, you know, has been um, is this, uh, you know, very uh, significant, very unique sort of relationship um, between organisms and machines. Um, and, uh, you know, cyborg, according to Haraway, is a social constructed hybrids of machines and organisms. And, you know, you know, Haraway talks about uh, two different types of cyborgs and, you know, these cyborgs operate at, you know, multiple, you know, various ontological levels. Um, one form of cyborg that Haraway talks about is the um, type of material cyborg. Um, and this is, um, you know, the cyborg that uh, Haraway mentions, um, you know, is the cyborg of science fiction films. Um, you know, that we see, um, you know, that literal cyborg that, uh, you know, continues to exist and become increasingly digitized in the context of mobile and wearable digital devices. So, um, you know, the body that is normalized by technologies, that is what she calls, um, you know, this in this material type of cyborg. And the second type of cyborg that she identifies um, with is, or, or that she identifies is that, uh, you know, the one that represents substantial contribution to theoretical literature on technocultures is uh, an ontological cyborg. So she's actually talking about two different types of, uh, you know, cyborgs here and um, with, um, an assumption that they not only um, the impact of a changing world, but of the centrality of science and technology in these changes, um, you know, cannot be undermined. So uh, just imagine the concept, uh, I'm sure you must have, um, you know, watched films um, that deals with the concept of uh, the cyborg or you've read books that deals with the concept um, of the cyborg. And, um, you know, just think of the ideological construct that is going behind the scene to construct, um, you know, the cyborg, whether it's in a film, whether it's in a book, um, or in your imagination. So, um, you know, the cyborg, um, in a way you will see, um, 
um, it sort of challenges certain assumptions and certain binaries that we are familiar with in within society. And so, um, you know, cy cyborgs often speak to questions of, um, you know, hybridity. Um, and that is, um, you know, the, the image of the cyborg, uh, the ideological construction of the cyborg then, um, you know, then gives us an indication to move beyond social uh, binaries. And so in Haraway's work, we do see that um, she talks about these boundary ruptures, um, you know, three forms of boundary ruptures uh, in her work. Um, that, uh, you know, the first one is um, the boundary uh, rupture between human and animal. Um, the second is between organism and machine. And um, the third one between physical and non-physical. So, um, so what, what Haraway is doing actually in her concept of uh, the cyborg is that she's possibly, uh, you know, trying to express uh, the broader idea that um, no human bodies uh, in this case, no, um, you know, the idea of embodiment, no human bodies or selves are stable or natural. And this is a very powerful idea that Haraway is bringing in um, that, uh, you know, we are rather multiple bodies or multiple selves, depending on the context in which we find ourselves and the other bodies and non-human entities with which we interact. So what Haraway is actually proposing here um, is that, um, you know, the disruption of the human body because of the presence uh, of the digital and the images that are constructed because of that disruption. Um, so Haraway actually brings forward, uh, you know, for us, um, you know, a very unique form of embodiment, a very unique form of how we um, understand selfhood. Um, and, you know, with regard to, uh, you know, the types of images, in this case, the image of the cyborg, um, you know, being constructed. So what she's proposing is the idea of multiplicity. What she's proposing is the idea of multiple bodies, multiple selves, and, um, you know, this is depending, of course, on the context in which we find ourselves uh, and other bodies and non-human entities which we interact with. So she is bringing in the elements that we were talking about, for example, um, you know, Foucault's idea of power and the image. Um, you know, we are, she's bringing in the elements of the human um, the non-human, the social context, and the power dynamics that actually, you know, ties them together. Um, and she is situating the image of the cyborg, um, you know, in, in, within its social, cultural power networks. And a cyborg, the image of a cyborg can only be born um, because uh, you know, as a social group, as a society, um, you know, has made certain, um, you know, transition into the digital and therefore um, the process of embodiment of that, uh, you know, caused by that digital is going to be, um, you know, a different way. So, um, I welcome you to read a little more about cyborgs if you're interested along these lines of inquiry. Um, and also see how, um, you know, Haraway paints various, um, you know, images of boundary, um, you know, transgression of, you know, what, uh, what sort of dynamics, what sort of power geometries um, are negotiated in these boundary transgressions. Um, and so the cyborg then becomes, you know, a very powerful, ideological construct, um, you know, to talk about uh, the role of images and embodiment in the digital age. So Haraway uh, then talks about bringing all of these together, um, uh, you know, across disciplinary boundaries and, uh, you know, from biosciences to computer sciences to contemporary culture. and. Um, she states that I argue for a politics rooted in claims about fundamental changes 
in the nature of class, race and gender in an emerging system of world order analogous in its novelty and scope to that created by industrial capitalism. We are living through a movement from an organic industrial society to a polymorphous information system from all work to all play simultaneously material and ideological. From the comfortable old hierarchical dominations to the scary new networks I have called the informatics of domination. So Haraway here summarizes many of the dynamics that we have uh, you know talked about and will be talking about um, in the in, in this uh, lecture series that uh, you know um, the the questions of social inequalities this qu the questions of social stratification the the questions of um, you know um, intersectionalities which um, you know I will deal with um, in um, in lecture 9 um, is you know she's bringing in this ideas that you know behind the scene when we create uh, you know the image of the cyborg um, you know in that process we are also going through these dynamics of um, you know social inequalities social uh, you know stratification and she talks about um, you know three powerful uh, variables here of social class race and gender um, you know that that goes um, in in informing these dynamics. So I want to close off um, this lecture with um, the idea of constructing place in the digital and I use an example here um, you know when we talk of embodiment and images um, in the digital space um, you know I want you to keep in mind the properties of uh, you know a digital environment and a digital environment that are recordable evocative, referential and hybrid contribute to a more engaging sense of place. So as the digital would evolve, uh, you know, the sense of place in the digital would also evolve. Um, and so when we think of how shape, uh, you know, how space is shaped in the digital and how to situate, um, you know, the self in the digital, um, you know, what um, are we actually looking at that you know when we think of technologies such as um, you know AR and VR um, you know the questions we need to ask is you know what then of a body moving in virtual space so when we have created you know something like a VR something like an augmented reality or virtual reality um, you know a vir in, in a virtual space what does it mean um, you know for embodiment um, you know to be mobile what does it mean for embodiment to be influenced um, you know in a, in a digital space and um, you know you can find um, you know lots of examples about that um, you know in 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 the works of uh, scholars who have dealt with the digital embodiment and um, images and these are the questions um, you know that are coming from there so um, I want to close this lecture with a question to you um, depending on uh, you know your social location and uh, your uh, academic vantage points. Um, so we have looked at the cyborg in this lecture as um, um, you know an ideological construct of an image um, in digital spaces um, and you know this ideological construct would mean um, you know different uh, you know images in different contexts and therefore the um, you know the viewer and the viewed relationship would be very different um, you know in this case. So I want you to consider I wanted to ponder um, this question that is the cyborg uh, as an ideological construct of image in digital space um, a narrative of progress and if yes um, I urge you to think um, you know how of progress. We, on that note, I would like to conclude this lecture. Thank you.